Um, just want to welcome everyone here tonight. Uh, my name is Eric Arguello. I'm the Advocacy Manager Manager under Glide Center for Social Justice. And on behalf, behalf of Glide, we thank you for joining our monthly justice event tonight called Harm Reduction as Justice, Policy, Courage, and Survival. Uh, we'd like to start tonight by acknowledging and honoring our indigenous land. We acknowledge that we are on the unseceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush Ohlone have never seceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who resided in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community, and by affirming their sovereign rights as first peoples. With that, I'd like to first thank our harm reduction program at GLI for partnering and collaborating with the Center for Social Justice to produce this virtual justice event. Uh, and now uh, I want to introduce Juliana de Pietro, who will be our host tonight. Juliana joined GLIDE as Director of Human uh, Reduction Services in late 2020. She oversees GLIDE's syringe access services, mobile and on-foot community outreach teams, HIV, HCV, STI testing programs, and community, community uh, navigator program. Prior to joining GLIDE, Juliana spent several years working in service to unhealthy people and people who use drugs in Portland, Oregon. She holds a master's in public health from Harvard University. So with that, Juliana, it's all yours. Thank you, Eric. Welcome everyone. I am thrilled to be here to join you as a part of GLIDE's Harm Reduction Services Program and in collaboration with the Center for Social Justice here who has been such an incredible partner for us as we advocate for the work that we do in San Francisco and beyond. As Eric mentioned, I oversee a variety of person-centered services designed to serve and, of course, in the spirit of GLIDE, radically include and deeply love people who use drugs. Our services work closely with a rich network of harm reductionists in San Francisco and the Bay Area and beyond, and build upon decades of hard work and activism in this city and across the country and across the world in pursuit of dignified and public health oriented approaches to substance use and drug use. Uh, our work is also of course centered in dismantling the systems that have fueled the failed and racist war on drugs that has gone on in our country for far too long and perpetuated vast harms against drug users of color and their communities. I'm really looking forward to speaking with our panelists this evening and hearing about their perspectives on harm reduction and as it relates to policy and justice as we move into, into this new world that we're living in, in the, in the COVID era and beyond. So I'd like to introduce our panelists now. Uh, first, we have Wes Saver, the policy manager for Glide Center for Social Justice. Wesley Saver joined the Center for Social Justice in 2019. As the policy manager, he oversees the local and state policy agendas which include a broad portfolio of priorities to address the systemic inequities facing the GLIDE community. Originally from Chicago, as an advocate, educator, human services provider, and organizer, he has over a decade's track record of serving systemically marginalized communities in California, Illinois, and North Carolina, particularly youth and families most impacted by circumstances of poverty, homelessness, and the criminal legal system. Prior to joining the Center for Social Justice, Wes was a policy advocate at John Burton Advocates for Youth, a nonprofit founded by retired state Senator John Burton, committed to improving the quality of life for youth in California who have been in foster care or homeless. And he was named a juvenile justice reform fellow at the Policy Advocacy Clinic at Berkeley Law, where he helped abolish harmful, costly, and unlawful juvenile administrative fees in California. Wes received a master's degree in public policy from the University of California at Berkeley and a bachelor's in international and intercultural studies from Pitzer College. Welcome Wes and thank you for joining us. Our next panelist is Del Seymour. We like to say that there are two mayors in San Francisco, the one who governs over the entire municipality and another in a fedora and pinstriped suit who presides over about 16 square blocks northeast of City Hall. Mayor of the Tenderloin, 
Raising Hope, the unofficial mayor is Del Seymour. A Vietnam veteran turned philanthropist, Seymour was chronically homeless for 18 years. He's a former cocaine addict and at one point was the biggest dope dealer off of Market Street. Dell has been nicknamed the mayor of the Tenderloin. Welcome Dell, and thank you for being here. Finally, I'd like to introduce the harm reduction program manager at Glidon and my good friend, John Negrete. John is a lifelong Californian who has lived both rural and urban lives. John has had a long and complex relationship with drugs and homelessness and is currently housed and working as a program manager for Glide's Harm Reduction Services. He's also served as an educator, advocate, and activist for Native peoples and places in California. Welcome, John, and thank you for being here. I'm thrilled to be here with you all. Um, this will hopefully be a, a casual and also rich conversation where I'll ask some questions that each of you are free to answer as you see fit in your own time and turn. Uh, and if you have nothing to add to that question, that's totally fine. Um, we'll move through. And then for our audience, we'll save some time at the end for a few questions as well. So let's get started. Uh, my first question to you, Wesley, Dell, and John. Define harm reduction from your perspective. What does it mean to you? Well, I would say that that it's the practice when you when you feel when a person feels they can't go cold turkey uh, and immediately stop abusing whatever they're abusing, whatever drug or material or lifestyle they're abusing. Uh, there's a secondary option, which is fairly new. I mean, it's 15 to 18 years old called harm reduction, where you now have the option of, of not having to completely stop an addictive behavior that that believe it or not, football players that are, are risking losing millions or billions of dollars, they can't stop. So we can't expect a person in the tent across the street to stop if that football player can't stop who has a lot financially to lose. I remember years ago when I went to the VA, that was maybe only 15 years ago. And the VA's policy was if you've been used, using in the last 24 hours, we cannot help you, our door is not open. And my, my argument was, this is the time when I really need you. If I have used in the last 25, this is really the time I need your guidance and help. And so Glide has been the pioneer, really the pioneer in San Francisco for coming up and being bold enough to step out there and say, we will, we will honor harm reduction. We will deal, we will not scold people for you use or being under the influence when you come to our place. Um, I remember going to a church once in, the, in my community in, ba in the Bayview area uh, or the community of Bayview where the deacon would not let me in church because he said he smelled that I haven't smoked in cocaine. And I admitted, I said, yes, I have. He said, well, you can't come in here. This is not a place for, for folks like that. So it, it's in, to in turn, it's, it's allowed hundreds or maybe thousands of people in San Francisco to seek and receive help and get mutual understanding and fellowship that never would have been afforded that chance. So how many lives have we, are we saving by this? Countless, because otherwise you'd just be thrown back out in the street. I'll jump in. Thank you, Del. Um, so harm reduction can certainly be defined differently depending on who you speak to. And I hope what I have to share complements uh, that of Dell's and John's definition. But well, uh, well, we all take risks. We also take steps to reduce the propensity for harm uh, from those risks that we take. In. And these harm reduction measures are all around us. We've got seat belts, we've got N95 masks right now, sunscreen. And these are things that help prevent us from being injured or dying uh, from things that are preventable. And it saves lives and money. So for me, uh, harm reduction is referring to a problem-solving approach aimed at intentionally mitigating those negative consequences associated with the harmful, criminalized, stigmatized, or, or risky activity. And given that it's Overdose Awareness Month and, and Overdose Awareness Day is approaching at the end of the month, uh, we can place it in that context. So over 93,000 people died of overdose in the United States last year, 712 of those in San Francisco alone. And these deaths 
in many ways were preventable. And if these are preventable deaths, then to me, as the policy manager, this means that each overdose death is ultimately a policy failure. Thank you, Wes. Thank you, Dell. Um, I don't know that I can define harm reduction. It has so many different meanings for me. Um, for me, it's 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 a spiritual path in a sense. Harm reduction is um, from the heart. It's treating people as they are, as human beings, with dignity and respect. Um, drug users are stigmatized, as as Wes mentioned, uh, criminalized, um, and when you meet somebody um, truthfully and from your heart, <clears throat> they are open to, to sharing their stories, which can enable changes to happen within each of us. And I find that harm reduction for myself has opened up paths to, to my living a much healthier and richer life. And that the more typical, uh, the medical, uh, psychological, um, traditional uh, paths to getting better um, did not serve me well. It was people who knew what I've been through who did not look down upon me. And I also find in the work that um, when you meet people and they're able to tell you their, their hardest day they're like Dell talked about when you that that 24 hours when you need it the most is when you get usually when people get stigmatized or arrested or you know put in a box which is not going to contribute to a healthier or better um lifestyle so it's about treating people as human beings and meeting people um as equals, um, getting rid of the labels of doctor, patient, counselor, client. It's being fellow human beings on the same path to trying to live a happy and fulfilling life. Thank you all so much for those answers. Um, you each touched upon different areas of harm reduction. And indeed, as John said, there's so many different ways that harm reduction shows up, as Wes mentioned, with, with some of our current pandemic context and the way that we're wearing masks and the seat belts we wear in our cars, and, and also as, as harm reduction applies to drug use, as, as Del and John mentioned as well, um, and beyond. And, and though we have so many definitions and iterations and manifestations of harm reduction, there are some misconceptions about what harm reduction is and, and what it does in community. Um, so I'd love to pose to our panelists what are some misconceptions you're aware of about harm reduction? And, and when you hear them, how do you address them? So I think in general, the naysayers feel that harm reduction is making people drug addicts. And it's almost like the line I use when I counsel people on how to deal with, with, with our people laying on the street. And, if, and, and I use the phrase, if a guy is laying on the street and you walking over and me say, hey, buddy, hey, would you buy me a beer? And most people, I, I put that scenario and say, hell no. Uh, it, 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 it's it's going to make him drunk. I said, Doug, he's probably already a drunk if he's laying on the ground. So you're not making nobody anything. By, by giving these apparatus, apparatus out and services out and, and tolerating or going along with people that are still using, we don't encourage. So harm reduction model does not include encouraging anyone to use. That has never happened. And again, the naysayers feel that we're out telling people, it's okay to keep using, just keep using. Here, how many needles do you want? We're not encouraging, we're just asking people to do it safer. We keep in mind what harm it could do if it's abused or not done hygienically uh, correct, what, what kind of diseases and after effects or side of, uh, not after effects, well, after effects, side effects you can have by not being clean in what you're doing and thoughtful. And um, so that's the that's from the, my naysayers that tell me the same thing. You guys giving out Brillo and pipes, they're making everyone to No, that person probably already has an addiction, and we're not encouraging. We're just trying to make his or her life safer and less side effects. Uh, and hopefully, along the way, they'll realize the damage they have done, 
and 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 they will lower their use. I mean, that that's the hopeful thing. But if, if that happens, good. If it don't happen, it's still okay. Great, thank you, Doug. I'm really glad you asked this question, Juliana. Uh, the U.S. has historically been resistant to supporting harm reduction programs for people who use drugs, and many people still have a shaky or non-existent understanding of the approach. And at Glide, um, I'm sure John can speak more to this, but we do quite a bit of work around dispelling myths and misinformation and the harms that come from the associated misunderstandings, stigma, and maltreatment that people subsequently endure can be deadly, especially when people are, are marginalized and using shame and isolation. And these are significant factors that contribute to the unnecessary deaths of so many. And Dell touched on one of the more prominent misconceptions uh, that harm reduction encourages substance use. And we know that some people are going to continue using drugs despite the consequences and whether or not they have access to supplies. So harm reduction programs, uh, syringe service programs offer free supplies. So financial barriers do not discourage people from safer practices. Um, I'll add one more um, uh, because it pertains to legislation in California. And that misconception is that it's illegal to give out needles or safer using supplies or safer smoking, safer snorting. And the reality is that the distribution of these in California is not a crime. In 2018, uh, California Health and Safety Code was amended in order to expand the scope of materials that may have been made available for public health purposes by syringe service programs. And the law provides very clearly that staff, volunteers, program participants shall not be subject to criminal prosecution for possession of needles or syringes or any materials deemed by a local state health department uh, to be necessary to prevent the spread of communicable disease or to prevent drug overdose. So any jurisdictions in California where they're encountering this issue around maybe the police or people saying that it's illegal uh, for providers to distribute these safer use supplies um, are, are wrong. And uh, folks can check in with the California Department of Health Office of AIDS um, for assistance there on how to address those issues locally. Thank you, Wes. Um, desperate people do desperate things. Um, I um, do outreach in the Tenderloin handing out, handing out supplies. And I hear about how the supplies that I hand out in the daytime for free are sold for $10, $20 at night because there's none out there. <clears throat> Not only are these supplies um, hygienic, um, safe to use, um, they may prevent someone having to have to have to do sex work to be able to purchase some when they need it. Um, I, I pose this question to people who, who are non-drug users. Um, if, if I gave you a needle, would that make you go use heroin? I think every single person would say no. It's not the needle, it's not the pipe that is promoting the drug use. It's much deeper social and personal spiritual issues that are, are causing it. There's all kinds of factors behind people's relationship with, with substances. And providing these supplies gives people opportunities to do it safely. I've seen people go through their gut. I, I've done in my, people will do that. De desperate people will do desperate things. And so, by providing safe hygienic supplies, we not only prevent the spread of disease, we, we give people the dignity of being able to have their needs met without having to do dangerous things to, to continue their, their needs to get met. So, thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, we just heard a bit about this next question from John about folks who engage in sex work and how harm reduction can can help in that uh, in that those interactions and transactions either by if harm reduction is available um, supporting folks in, in not having to trade sex for supplies um, and if it's not if supplies are not available how that can make life a bit more difficult for folks who engage in sex work 
uh, from from Wes on the policy side about the laws that support or hinder harm reduction and, and from Dell in terms of how harm reduction can show up in our communities and um, help to dismantle in some of the stigmas. Um, but I wanna dig in just a bit deeper with all of you about how harm reduction helps people survive. How does harm reduction promote survival both for individuals and communities? Well, you know, I, I think it, it, it being involved involved in understanding and respecting harm reduction, and I'm talking about the clients. The clients have to have respect for this concept also. And it's not just something that's, just, it, it cannot be done in just, oh, uh, this is convenience. It's gotta be more than this, not only being convenient, but it's also good for my health. It's good for my health, it's good for my partner's health, because especially the, your, your, your life partner, because the you, the healthier you remain, the healthier that your partner will remain, or actually everyone else in that tent, because it, 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 it so much lowers the chance of getting a communicable disease. I mean, it's one of the bigger ways that, that, that I can't imagine the, how, how I'll, I'll just use Glide, because Glide is most prominent. The, the, and I've written stories about Glide being the saviors out there in the middle of the night behind a dumpster pulling a needle out of someone's arm and giving them a clean needle. Uh, so many stories about it, how many lives they have saved. I remember when this harm reduction and Narcon first came on scene and they would, your team would go out and save somebody and they would run, and I would be at Glide doing something, whatever. And they would run back to Glide and be in the hallway. We saved somebody's life, we saved somebody. We got this guy, he was dead. We saved this. They don't even do that no more. You know why? Because they're doing it 10 to 15 times a day. So it's not even an issue no more. It's not even something you, you I mean, they still celebrate it, but it's just, it's just run of the mill. So uh, uh, if you would just follow them one night, the naysayers, to see what harm reduction does and how people respect our teams when they come, it's like, it's like the, the you know, this is like, this, I mean, they, the old people come out to tents because they know glides on the block and they can get their stuff. They can get that. They call needles gas. They can get their gas. They can get their alcohol. And when they ask them for alcohol swabs, that means they're using them. We're not like putting them in people's pocket. People say, can I have some swabs? Can I have some needles? Can I have some hand sanitizer? So this is a whole new lifestyle. They realize they're living in the most unhygienic uh, 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 protocol in life, living in a tent on Ellis Street or Eddie Street, whatever, they're all the same, but at least they've elevated their life to where they can be and still do their habits as safely as possible. Without any real, ain't nobody saying, I'm gonna give you this, but you gotta stop using that shit. Ain't nobody coming to them like that. No one's discussing their drug habits for their lifestyle. We're just, we're just being help, helpful. Uh, uh, uh. And you know, just as a sideline, I remember maybe the, the black community in, in Chicago, I'm from Chicago also, I, I, I know Wes is, and in that community, the moms and the pops and the grandma and the grandpas probably started harm reduction back then. Because when you were 18, 17, 18 years old, and your grandmama knew you was going out to drink with your buddies, she would say, you all come over here, you'll drink here. You'll go down to the basement and that way I can watch you and I can shut you off when you need to be shut out. And say, I don't want you out there drinking on the curb in the alley, you come here and drink. That was harm reduction. At, at, at its infancy, so. Great examples, thank you, Del. Um, how does harm production help people survive? So in 2000, the San Francisco Health Commission uh, unanimous, unanimously passed a resolution adopting a harm reduction policy uh, for substance abuse, SCDs, HIV treatment, and prevention services in the city and county, um, and programs that serve people who use drugs. And this is really a guiding local principle. It's a public health philosophy, and it's something that promotes methods of reducing the harms associated with the different issues we've already mentioned. Um, in this case, uh, it means that clients in San Francisco are entitled to culturally competent, non-judgmental services delivered in a manner that demonstrates respect uh, for individual dignity, 
and self-determination. So we're looking at comprehensive treatments. Um, they need to include strategies that um, reduce harm for those clients who are either unwilling or unable to modify their safe behavior. And this could be connecting people to education and healthcare, um, providing people with access to naloxone, um, sterile supplies, and safe drug supplies, um, which can help prevent the spread of HIV um, and viral hepatitis, and give people who use drugs access to things like supervised consumption services, uh, so that life-saving interventions are close at hand um, in a clinical space in the event of overdose. And I want to return, um, because it's been mentioned, uh, to the sex worker lens, um, an example. During the pandemic, we've seen a lot of people who provide in-person services shift to online platforms. And this has been in the news lately, um, kind of around some of those platforms and conversation around that. But folks have been successful at making a living in this manner online um, while not exposing themselves to potential in-person harms uh, during the pandemic. So it really can take on a lot of different shapes um, uh, uh, for survival. I kind of want to circle back to the how I answered the first question about um, what does harm reduction mean to me? Because <clears throat> how does harm reduction help people survive? I think it removes the isolation from people, separation from people by building relationships and trust by showing up authentically and without judgment. And that breaks apart that isolation and separation, the stigma, all in a negative self talk that, that is created from the stigmatization, the criminalization of drug users. And I think when that isolation and separation is broken down, the, the education can begin about Narcan, about also about not using a loan. So um, someone can, you know, save your life if you overdose, if you, if you make the connection with the other people. The education goes further. We, um, so Narcan, I think Kristen Marshall, who's the head of the Dope, uh, Dope Project, which is really behind the distribution of Narcan and saving thousands of lives in San Francisco. I believe she had a quote that if, if drug users weren't using Narcan and saving lives, San Francisco would have to rent coolers for all the dead bodies that would be out there. And it's drug users saving drug users' lives with Narcan. And they see that. They see that work. And that spreads to other things that harm reduction does. We are starting to provide PPE now. We're providing masks and gloves, hand sanitizer. Um, Julian and I went out on a um, walkabout with a reporter and they were from Southern California and they couldn't believe that all our on house people were asking for masks and wearing masks. They're like, they don't, you know, our regular, you know, our house people don't wear masks. And harm, the harm reduction in San Francisco has created a culture that has promoted healthier habits, not just in drug use, but when it's come to COVID, um, people are wearing masks. They're washed, they're doing, they're taking the, the like, uh, Dell mentioned the, the alcohol wipes. They're not asking the alcohol wipes to try and get drunk off of them. They know that that's to keep them from getting abscesses. And it's, it's that education, it's that connection, and that helps people survive. And, this, and in this day and age of COVID, the fentanyl, just all the things that are coming together in San Francisco at this time, the amount of lives that are being saved, it's, it's saving a generation of people right now, harm reduction, and it's, um, it's a powerful thing. Thank you, thank you all. I wanna uplift the point you just made, John, about how drug users practicing harm reduction with other drug users are the folks who are saving the vast, vast majority of lives in, in San Francisco and, and beyond. I know Del mentioned our team's participation in that as well. And um, I want to highlight Glide's community safety team and all of our other frontline services who, in, who save lives every day, as you mentioned, Del. And, and also, it's so important to support the people who are in the community 24-7 providing life-saving services to one another. Um, I want to turn a bit more personal. Um, so much of harm reduction work uh, and our communities who provide harm reduction work is uh, 
as part of a deeply personal journey for folks who may have lived experience with substance use. I know for me, I've got my own journey and uh, harm reduction is largely the reason I'm still here today. And I would love to turn to our panelists who feel comfortable answering, who'd like to answer, who have something to answer. Um, and please feel free not to, if you don't want to. What is your journey with harm reduction? Please share your story with us. I'm actually in the harm reduction program right now, uh, dealing with alcohol. Uh, I have not yet, oh, did I lose? Can you still hear me? Something happened. I can hear you. Oh, oh, good. Oh, okay. As long as you can like hear. Someone else's screen sharing. Okay. Um, oh, I see. Okay. I can. So, um, there we go. I actually have not yet felt comfortable abstaining from alcohol. But because I ran into a situation a couple of years ago, I, I found that my use was way over what it should be. And thank God nothing happened. But just when I realized what could have happened or what could happen, and I'm speaking of alcohol and driving. So before I was, I, I, would, I would go probably way over where I would have to drive with one eye and I would still actually get in that car and go home, which is as nutty as nut, nutty can be. So now that's number one thing on my mind. And that's, that's, that's no different than I think Wes says, putting a seatbelt on in the car. You know, limiting your, 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 your intake of alcohol is the same as putting a seatbelt on. Not the same, I mean, no, no, no one would argue that. But it, both are methods of harm reduction. And, and I take it very, very serious. Uh, I probably could stop 100% if I really wanted to, and maybe I can. not And there are people that, that I know when I, was, when I was using hard drugs and I got into a program where they tested me every other day, which made it impossible to use drugs. I finally turned myself into the sheriff's department and says, I can't do this program. Put me in, let me go to jail, do my time to get out so I can get back into my drug use. And they, <laughs> they actually let me do it. But uh, yeah, you know, and, and um, I guess that's my personal story with it. And that's, that's why I, I know it works and, and it can work because the people that, that, that don't practice it or not allowed to practice it are left back out doing whatever harm, as much harm as they can do. Thank you for sharing, Del. Um, I, I'm going to share a little less here, but uh, my journey stemmed from people in my life overdosing, um, people in my life struggling with their journey when it came to substance use and being unable to adhere to the abstinence-based programs that they were engaging with, um, and also my having conducted and been president, present um, for overdose reversals. And uh, along the way, realizing that harm reduction can include reduction uh, or the cessation of use, but that um, it complements uh, treatment stat strategies in a time of relapse uh, if the goal for an individual is ultimately abstinence. And that's okay. But um, uh, just that growing understanding of the broad spectrum of strategies uh, that are available to people and, and how vital it is um, that we have that broad spectrum available to people. Because of the stigma attached to drug use, I'm still a little bit leery about sharing my personal um, story, but I can, I can share uh, Juliana's um, statement about it was a major factor in why I'm here today. Um, I can I definitely feel comfortable sharing about in my professional life how um, my journey with harm reduction. Um, I was involved in uh, starting a nonprofit uh, um, <clears throat> uh, working towards the disproportionality of native youth in foster care. And the majority of the families that were threatening to lose their their children to the to the state was because of drugs and alcohol, and um, the the county and the state had discovered that uh, the 
the county's system had not worked for native peoples and that they were gonna try native people providing services to native people. And that's when I first started doing a deep dive into harm reduction, because it gave an option that a lot more people um, were ready to try. And it enabled them to keep their children because their behaviors that were threatening the loss of their families were able to be um, changed or adjusted in a way through harm reduction practices that enabled them to keep their children. It also, I'd also like to share how a lot of the harm reduction values align with native values, indigenous values. Um, there's more of a communal collective um, approach than the individual, the drug user community looking out for each other rather than um, one person out for each other. There's the more than one way to do things, um, not, you know, um, not proselytizing, um, you know, that there's, there's, um, your way is okay. It doesn't have to be my way. Um, so that's another movement that's starting to happen across California and the West on native reservations is that both native people and harm reductionists are discovering how aligned the values and beliefs of harm reduction and indigenous culture are. And together, the, um, a lot of the, the death and struggles that are happening to not just native communities, but communities of color throughout all over the United States um, can be directly um, impacted by harm reduction practices and, and values. And uh, so that's, that would be my professional journey in harm reduction. Thank you all for sharing your lenses and your approaches to this work as it relates to your personal experience. It is so powerful to hear what drives your engagement with harm reduction and how it has impacted your lives. I appreciate your candor in this moment and with all of us. Turning to the theme of tonight's event and indeed our collaboration with the Center for Social Justice here at Glide, love to hear from all of you how harm reduction is, is truly justice work. How is harm reduction justice work? Well, I mean, basically the word justice is uh, based a lot in the word equality. Uh, and the thing is, are we carry, are we really our brother's keepers in neighborhoods like the Tenderloin and the Mission? Uh, do we do the same for folks, do neighbor to neighbor or organization to organization, do we do the same in the Tenderloin as we do in Orinda or Walnut Creek or Moran County? Uh, and that's where justice comes, comes in. That's what a basic premise of Glide's use of justice is that everyone should, should receive the same treatment and the same help. And, and, and in scale, I mean, maybe they don't have the same problems in Orinda, but they have problems in Orinda. And you never hear about them because that community takes care of itself. And we have problems in the Tenderloin, but our community, we take care of ourselves. And that's what justice is. We, we take care of our folks the same way Orinda people take care of their folks, uh, or, 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 or Vallejo, or, 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 or Fair, Fairview, or whatever. For so many years, we did not, we were not giving our neighbors the equal treatment that they should have gotten because of the stigmas. Oh, they're nothing but drunks. They're nothing but whores. They're nothing but dope fiends. And then people like Glide, St. Anthony's came in and says, no, these are, these are still God's children. These are human beings. These are animals. These people have, uh, originally they were saying, these are just people that made a left turn in life. And I came combat to that, that says, no, these are people that life took a left turn on them. And they should not be treated. They should be given, given. Uh, 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 I mean, spot for spot, spot the same consideration, not compassion, because that's like guilt tripping, but compassion. They should be given the same passion as it, as anyone else, regardless of their lifestyle. You know, and, and and man, you know, because of their lifestyle, these people almost have to live in the manner. And now I'm speaking from my 18 years sleeping across the street from Glide. These people almost have to live their lifestyle to maintain their addiction. 
I mean, it's a very close relationship with people. Say, they just want to be out there. No, they don't want to be out there. But because of their addiction, they have to be out there to maintain their addiction. And I'm sure other people on, on, on the panel can 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 uh, cue in on that also. So that's what, to me what justice means in our community. Del, I'm so glad you mentioned equity. Um, People who use drugs in San Francisco prove what's possible when they have access to the resources they need uh, to keep themselves and keep each other safe. Uh, they're doing the majority of the overdose reversals in San Francisco. They've saved thousands of lives. And even the figures that we can attempt to tabulate and land on are still dramatic undercounts, yet they're also criminalized for their use. And John and Juliana both touched on this. Um, harm reduction is an alternative to criminalization in many ways, and it enables our communities not to have to rely on policing, jailing, or punishment. So even though we aren't directly talking about abolition, many of tonight's concepts relate to the over-policing of our communities. And as a central part of the prison industrial complex, criminalization is one of the many tools uh, that police and courts use to target uh, both specific actions and specific groups of people. Um, entire groups of people and communities are criminalized when targeted by policing and by strengthening care, um, by reducing harm in our communities, we can build more power for large scale liberation. Um, this is especially important in cities around the Bay Area where racial and economic inequity is so egregiously high. Um, so harm reduction, uh, decriminalization, uh, these are essential to creating a healthy, sustainable, uh, equitable, and just um, community. Thank you, Wes. And Del, uh, you both touched upon subjects <clears throat> that I strongly agree with as far as justice and harm reduction. I consider harm reduction to be revolutionary. Um, it's, it flips everything on its head. It's, it empowers the drug users, disempowers the, the masters, the, the, the police. And I see most all the, the things that we are talking about boil down to decriminalization of drugs and the decriminalization of poverty. And um, without those changes, we're still going to have um, the masses of people sleeping outside. Um, Dell touching upon, I, I, I hear this so often, that, oh, people, people choose to sleep outside. Um, you know, all these tents are, are out here because people are choosing that way. You look back to the, the 30s and these Hoover, uh, Hoover, ten, Hoover towns, I think they were called, there's a historical pattern of these tents and people living outside, it's a direct correlation to poverty. And poverty, pro poverty breeds um, misery and, and drugs are one way to get through misery. Um, and so when this inequity that Wes was talking about, it gets so bad that you can't even afford a place to live, um, of course you're gonna sleep in a tent. Um, and sleeping in a tent is not, easy, even if you're young, but a lot of the people that sleep, sleep outside are not so young. And so it's, it's, it's a harm reduction. When I say it's revolutionary, is it, it's starting to address problems at its root is what I see. 20 years ago, we wouldn't even have the conversation about decriminalizing the police or de defunding the police, sorry. Um, or legalizing, uh, decriminalizing drugs, that it's even part of the conversation now, I think is in part to the work harm reduction has done. And the other thing real quickly, harm reduction is based upon facts. That's one thing that really drew me to it. It's based on science. Um, it's numbers and data. All the work we do is collected and tabulated. And so we, so we can figure out what works and what doesn't work. And so, um, for me, harm reduction is truly justice in the sense that it's changing the fundamentals of what's causing the problems. Thank you all for your reflections. John, I heartily agree with you that harm reduction is revolutionary and 
uh, subverts so much that is in place with the systems of power and of oppression that govern most of the context that we live in. Uh, so I'm grateful for it for that and so many other reasons. One of the ways that we advocate for justice within the context we live in now is through legislation and policy. It's one of many ways we can advocate on behalf of harm reduction. Um, it's also one of many ways we can dampen the impacts of harm reduction by putting policies in place. Um, like Wes mentioned, um, the policies that uphold in the carceral system, the criminal legal system, and that have fueled the war on drugs. Um, can hinder harm reduction and its positive impacts. So I'd love to hear from all of you as we're speaking of policy and legislative advocacy options for, for taking harm reduction steps, where can policy help or hinder harm reduction work? Uh, you know, you know, I mean, that's a very good issue because our lifestyles are driven by, by policy. Policy is a law. I mean, that's, those, those words are very interchangeable. Uh, so as I think John was saying, as, they, as we started to decriminalize uh, uh, drug use, especially in, especially in San Francisco, uh, the enforcement is, and I know this firsthand, the enforcement is nowhere near what it was in the 90s in the early thousands, uh, I, I personally have 14 felony arrests from the uh, 80s and 90s in the Tenderloin, 14 arrests. And just as a matter, and most of these arrests by, was by one particular police officer who's still around. This is in, in the 80s and I, but, but he's still around. So I was at City Hall right before the epidemic last year and coming out of the mayor's office, having the meeting at the other mayor's office. And uh, I ran into him in the hallway and we, you, you, you know, we greeted each other and, 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 and he says, I, I see you doing a lot better than you were some years ago. And I says, uh, yeah. And, and, and I said, by the way, why were you always arresting me, dude? And he says, man, I figured the more I arrest you, the more you, the more arrests I would give you, the more you would think about stopping. And I told him, you know, you did just the opposite because I was in jail so much, I got comfortable with jail. Jail did not scare me no more. So when I would see you coming, I could care less because the worst could happen, you're gonna take me to jail. I get a good night's sleep, I'll, I'll be back out tomorrow. So that's not the way. That policy of arresting, I mean, chronic drug users or, or drug, really does not work. So if we just got to prove it to the people in Sacramento, people in Sacramento is a combination of every, from all states, from the, from the hill, people up in the hills, to the people on the beach in San Diego, to the people freezing up in Redding. So you got a big combination of people that all work on that same law. The problems they have in Redding or the beaches in San Diego are not the problems that we have in, in 94102. So it's hard to get policy change and Pass in Sacramento. It's even hard to get it done in in, in in San Francisco. Those people in the Sunset and Richmond are not the same people on Sixth Street. Never will be. I mean, we had a we had a big thing trying to open a homeless shelter right there near the ferry building. Now all of a sudden, these people who have bought some of those new condos right there on the waterfront, where in the hell did they come from? Are you to come from Utah or Montana or something? You can't be San Franciscans with the attitude that you have. So if you would think in San Francisco it would be easy for us to get policy and legislation passed, giving easy use. Look how many years we've been trying to get this safe use site. We've been doing that for years, and we're still bouncing our heads up. They've opened it, opened these sites all over the world, but not in liberal, far left, liberal ass San Francisco. It hasn't happened yet, and I don't know when it's going to happen. So I mean, we got to. We got to not go with the attitude. Well, this is San Francisco. They'll pass it. Everyone, no, everyone don't agree with us. In Sacramento, everyone don't agree. So we got to people like West. We all need to work harder on what we're doing and just not take it for granted that everyone agrees with our method of treating folks. Great, thanks, Del. Um, I'm going to continue the thread of discussing criminalization uh, because that's inherently the policy process, criminalizing certain behaviors or increasing the regulation of others, right? So that's the process through which actions become illegal. 
and it's a construct. Uh, it's uh, what's considered a crime depends on the time, depends on the place, depends on politics, and actions become crimes uh, only after they've been legally and culturally defined as such. So many crimes, though, um, some that we've discussed already, uh, are acts of survival, right, uh, that poor and systemically oppressed communities rely upon. So in the context of overdose, Juliana, you mentioned the war on drugs. Um, these types of regulations have long been implemented and still the number of overdoses continues to rise. Criminalization of drugs does not address the conditions of drug use. Uh, it further stigmatizes and further harms communities, primarily black and brown communities, and has for years and perpetuates further cycles of state violence. So if we wanna stop preventable deaths, harm reduction is a clinically proven approach. Uh, the science behind harm reduction interventions is emphatic and people deserve every opportunity to be as safe as possible. So how can policy help? Um, we've seen Oregon recently successfully pass drug decriminalization during the last presidential election. And I would hope this takes root here in California because criminalization pushes people to the margins and increases the likelihood of overdose. Um, in the meantime, uh, and Dell just very rightly named this, uh, thank you, Dell, uh, a policy that could be tremendously helpful uh, and needs to be immediately prioritized is allowing for supervised consumption services. Uh, this was recently passed in Rhode Island earlier this summer uh, and, and Scotland um, recently as well too, um, allowing people to use previously obtained drugs in, cr in clinical environments saves lives. That's irrefutable. Um, Senate Bill 57 authored by Senator Scott Wiener would allow for this. Um, in the over 100 supervised consumption sites worldwide, there's yet to be a single fatal overdose. And in July, um, SB 57, uh, it was made into a two-year bill, but I would hope that it has the enthusiastic support of the legislature and the governor when it's taken up again next year, and then it becomes law when it can be heard again in 22. In the meantime, San Francisco, uh, I would urge this policy to be implemented immediately uh, to scale and city and county wide, not a pilot program. We need this in every district of the city um, because overdose is not unique to the Tenderloin. Overdose is not unique to people ex who are homeless. There are many people who are using uh, stigmatized and in isolation around the city, around the county, around the state, around this country, um, uh, who are not homeless as well. Overdose is not uniquely a homeless issue. And uh, we need to make sure that our communities have access to these opportunities uh, to use uh, previously obtained drugs, licit or illicit, um, uh, with that care uh, close at hand to keep them safe. I'm gonna use a broader term, but I think it encompasses everything that Wes and Dell were speaking about, decriminalization. Um, it's opportunity. For myself, I found my use of substances has directly correlated um, to lack of opportunity or in the opposite, when I have opportunities in life, the less um, I feel the need to do sometimes self-destructive behaviors. And when I talk about opportunities, I'm talking about the opportunity to not be locked up the opportunity to have a roof over your head, the opportunity to have food, the opportunity to have a decent living wage for your work. So it's, a, I, think, I think it's a more, it's systemic changes that give opportunities to everyone in an equitable ways. And that's when I went, you know, talk about historically when times when the inequities have, have grown to where they are, where they appear to be today, is when you start to see the misery and the the un, dis, what's the word un, instability or uh, just just the 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 suffering that the amount of suffering that's going on within this city right now is directly correlated to lack of opportunity in my opinion and policies that that provide equitable opportunities to all people I think <clears throat> are the policies that will help harm reduction. Um, really reach its goal, which is, in my opinion, to have people have fruitful and happier lives. Thank you all so much.
This has been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. And I've learned so much from all of you just in this past hour, in addition to all that I've learned from you outside of this wonderful Zoom. So thank you. I've got one more question for you and it is an action oriented question because it's, it's so important for us to dive deep into these concepts. And it's also so important for us, as Dell said, to continue to work and to work harder in, to, in the pursuit of justice as it relates to harm reduction work and beyond. So from your perspectives, what can folks, the 54 people on this call, folks beyond do to advocate for harm reduction, for just policies and for the destigmatization of substance use at the local level, state level and beyond? Well, um, I hope there's no politicians on this call, but if they are, so what? But politicians kind of go with the pop, our, our popularity people. So whatever the popular idea in their, in their community, that's what they push. You can't go to a, to a politician with an idea or request a politi for a policy change by yourself. He'll sit there with you and, and have that little cup of coffee in his office and tell, and tell you how much that he appreciates you coming with this. And when you walk out the door, that request goes in the garbage can because you're one person. That means nothing to him because he deals with numbers. He didn't get elected by one person and he does nothing, he does nothing dictated by one person. You need to get your neighborhood group, your people at your church, your people at, at your bowling alley, your people at your job, your people at your gym, and get them all together and you all go down in a group and let Mayor Bree know, let uh, uh, Supervisor Haney know how you feel about this safe consumption site. And, and, and to, to get the politicians, well, wow, there's a whole bunch of people from different populations and cultures got the same idea. So this must be something worth, worth doing. You know, and, and you got to come in numbers. You got to get on a bus and go to Sacramento or Amtrak, like we do a lot for homeless causes. We all get on Amtrak together and ride up and uh, uh, the state capital is three blocks away from Amtrak. And we go there in numbers and we sit there in that room and you'll see the legislation sitting, there, sitting up on that desk and they turn around and look at us and say, damn, that's a lot of people here. And I have been to sessions in Sacramento and at the Board of Supervisors, when I know they had made up their mind. They have made up their mind. They're not going to do this or they're going to do this. And they, they go behind the, the scenes and make these agreements with each other. We're all going to vote on this. And then we have come down there in numbers. I'm talking about hundreds of people. And they have too many testimonies until this 11, 12, 1 o'clock at night. And the end of that night, they have changed their decision. So it does work. Don't give up just because They've turned it down before. Keep doing it. Keep going down. Keep going together. Keep talking about it. We can't do it with one person. And, and it can't be it's just one organization. The more the mayor hears from different diverse folks, then it makes her be bolder. Now, she probably wants to do this, but she needs that urge. She needs that push to make this bold decision because it's a scary decision. And, and we were, I was in a meeting with her at Manny's Two, two or three weeks ago when she when, when she admitted on stage, yes, this is San Francisco, and we do do bold things. We do do things that are not necessarily legal. So let's keep pushing her. Uh, she is a, a main deal breaker or decision maker in this, but she needs to hear from more people than us nutty folks in the Tenderloin. She needs to hear from a lot of you people in Noy Valley, in, in, in Castro, in, in, in Richmond, out in Ocean View. So that's what we need to do, come to with a diverse voice when we go to these legislatures and just sit there until they say yes. Amazing, Dal. Um, wow. Uh, I, we can support um, healthier, safer communities by advocating for a number of things. Um, I'll, I'll, rattle some things off and, and hopefully some things resonate and inspire people. But John mentioned opportunity and he's absolutely right. Along those lines, um, and this may not be what he was referring to, but he did mention housing. We do need permanent 
affordable housing. Uh, we need to build on the successes of the shelter in place hotels that we've implemented during the pandemic in San Francisco. Maintain that program, uh, but also push the city to acquire more hotels locally uh, to give people a place to live. Those types of uh, rehab projects are they're far more cheaper than new construction and they come online almost immediately, uh, whereas new construction may not be available for years and years and years. And there's no guarantees there. More generally, uh, people can support ending policies with disparate outcomes that translate to more systemic inequality uh, concerning overdose, decriminalization, supervised consumption services, safer supply. Those all need uh, our righteous support. Um, Folks can attend a naloxone training so that they feel comfortable and equipped when they're around an overdose to uh, help be part of the solution there. Um, and being able to respond to different solutions and different, I'm sorry, different situations of harm without police is exactly uh, what we need to do and be willing to experiment with. So support the compassionate alternative response team that is a proposal that's been developed in San Francisco, also known as CART. Um, call city and county to do the things that they have said they want to do and make them do them uh, now. Otherwise, we will continue to be counting deaths and there could still be hundreds more this year. Dell mentioned demonstrating. There's a socially distanced demonstration that's gonna be held at City Hall uh, about the drug overdose crisis on the 31st next week and people can attend there. Uh, nationwide, locally, at the state, drug overdoses continue to escalate. And, uh, you know, we simply cannot afford to wait any longer. And Dell's right. Uh, um, we need our elected officials to be hearing from a broad swath of the population and, and show them that this is what we want, this is what we need, and we need it now. Thank you everyone for the, this opportunity and for listening um, to this conversation. I, I kind of want to go back to where I started was that this harm reduction for me is kind of spiritual work. The Glide logo is a heart. Um, I think if we all come from, from our heart space, we make relationship with people that we normally wouldn't. We start to know what the needs of our community is because we walk by people um, all the time and don't have conversations, don't even give a smile. So by building relationship with those we, we wouldn't normally build. And I just, I'm not just talking about the unhoused, I'm talking about the ones we disagree with. Cause like Dell Del spoke to, we need to talk to people in other neighborhoods that, that may not think the way we do. We need to have conversations from the heart with each other. Cause this is a, it's a, this is a, a, a much bigger problem than um, one, one legislative law it's it's a systemic in my opinion spiritual problem of the heart and the more we can connect with each other the more we can advocate for each other thanks again everyone thank you all so much so grateful for your time and your efforts in answering these questions we do have time for a few questions from our audience uh, i'm going to take them from the questions that came in in the chat and we'll go through as many as we can and have time for. Those that we don't have time for, please feel free to post and ask in the chat and I will share them and myself and the panelists as they're able, will get back to you as we can. Um, I do see a question really quickly about the events that Wes mentioned. We'll also be following up after this event with opportunities for advocacy, laying out the details of those events as well as some other resources that we would love folks to engage with. Um, so thank you for asking that. First question from the audience that I see um, is why the lag in setting up safe consumption sites, one of the policies that Wes touched on um, as something that could bring us closer to the harm reduction services that we wanna see in the protections for our community of drug users. Um, given the California law just quoted why why are we falling behind on this one? And panelists, um, you don't all have to answer if you don't want to, you spent a lot of time talking. So I'll, I'll open it up to whoever wants to take this question. Sure, I can feel that. And um, I think there, there's some mystery around maybe why this bill is not proceeding right now, but um, uh, by and large, 
uh, when previous bills were pushed and, and one made it to the governor's desk, Governor Brown at the time, uh, he vetoed the bill and said that there was too much carrot and not enough stick. And uh, that's something that I would uh, vehemently uh, be opposed to. We know that the stick does not work when it comes to harm reduction. We need services to be made available to people to uh, provide those opportunity for safe care and not further marginalization. Um, uh, there have been other attempts at this bill, um, hasn't moved forward. Currently it is stalled, um, but it has cleared the Senate. It is in the assembly side. Um, I think there's been some concerns um, during the previous presidential administration about uh, whether or not the federal government would come down on jurisdictions that uh, made supervised consumption services available because uh, they do provide spaces for people to use criminalized drugs in a, uh, a safe uh, clinical space. So the concerns that those jurisdictions would then be prosecuted by the federal government uh, has made folks reticent. I think a lot of eyes are on Rhode Island right now uh, to see how the current administration uh, will handle that. Um, in the meantime, um, there's nothing preventing uh, local jurisdictions like the city and county of San Francisco with going forward with this um, unless they're waiting to check in with the attorney general about something like this. And the attorney general might be waiting to check in uh, with uh, the feds. So it's, it's kind of local jurisdictions being um, um, concerned about uh, what's going to happen from the top down um, uh, each step of the way. And, um, you know, if someone was to go it alone and open a space on their own, uh, like a nonprofit, there's the risk of having all of their assets seized. Um, so it's, um, there are some legitimate barriers to doing so, but I think as soon as areas in California have that local support um, and, and they find creative ways to make this happen, I think you'll see more jurisdictions lean into it. Um, SB 57, like I mentioned earlier, uh, Los Angeles County signed on to the bill and wanted to be included. Oakland signed on to the bill and wanted to be included. San Francisco signed on to the bill and wanted to be included. And um, uh, hopefully more jurisdictions uh, find uh, the way forward as well. Yeah, to piggyback on, on that and also maybe piggyback on, on my earlier statement that I wish everyone could be like San Diego, Los Angeles, but we got we got Fresno, we got Porterville, we got uh, uh, these places where nowhere in the world would their assemblymen okay this, and that's that's where our fight is because we're not all one state. They, they, they are two different states. The valley in, in in California is not the same as the coast, and those people really don't understand what we're trying to do here. They don't have the same problems that we have. So they don't understand why it's an urgency. It's not even an option anymore. It's an urgency out here. Thank you both. Next question I see in the chat. Have public addiction treatment programs embraced the harm reduction philosophy? Can you re say that one more time, Juliana? Yeah, of course. It's a question of whether addiction treatment programs and, and the phrase is the public addiction treatment programs embraced harm reduction philosophy. I can think of a, an example of some treatment programs in San Francisco that are abstinence-based and also provide Narcan in their treatment facilities um, and as a way of acknowledging that drug use may still happen within treatment and that Narcan, naloxone is a life-saving and harm reduction measure that they need to implement. It's something I can think of. Any thoughts from you all? I'd just like to say that some support groups that you know um, are starting to explore other things besides abstinence-based, so maybe not um, private or specific um, treatment centers, but um, once again, drug users coming together to support themselves to um, live healthier lives, find alternatives to the 12-step program. And so there are groups that are finding alternatives that embrace the harm reduction 
models as a form of treatment um, for substance use? Yes, yeah, so uh, the two biggest holdouts in this, and they're big, is AA and NA. Maybe I shouldn't have said their names, but so what? They can't sue me. I don't have no money. Uh, they'll just be wasting their lawsuit. But NA, and until they embrace it, it's, 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 it's going uphill. And they're, as we all know, in general, the faith based organizations, faith based nonprofits generally do not embrace it. We've done examples. Uh, I, I mean, the waivers would be, of course, Glide. At one time, St. Anthony was 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 in collaboration with us, and they've have a new board, new board of a, a new board of directors that a more faith based board. And I'm not sure if they're even with us anymore. But that they would have been a great collaborator on on this. And I may be wrong. Maybe they still are, but I don't think so. But until we get in a a, a, a celebrate recovery is the third one. Uh, they're hard for the zero zero use. In fact, if you go to AA meeting tonight or in a meeting tonight and you have used drugs alcohol today they will not let you speak which i think is crazy as hell again it's almost like the other story. that's the time i really need to speak to share what i'm going through because i'm high as hell i need to let other people in this what i thought was my family here and then they later but no, you said on the corner be quiet because you're high come on man really that's why i don't go to eat either one of them that they they just don't fit my template Thank you all for your perspectives. Got a couple of questions in the chat about using harm reduction to address the mental health, the emotional, the social components of drug use. So question from Margie about harm reduction collaborating with, with others, maybe other movements or other parts of our movement to help with, with the mental part of addiction. Um, and then from Kathy, what are the emotional and social components of harm reduction? Are there support groups along those lines that uh, are, are in line with harm reduction and, and the work that we do? I think there's a movement amongst, especially in San Francisco, but other um, more progressive um, cities and counties to integrate mental health and harm reduction as a philosophy um, uh, rather than a um, specific practice of, of drug use in the sense of trauma-informed care, strength-based practices. All these are fundamentals of harm reduction that um, I think align well with some new thoughts about mental health um, and um, programs that are um, starting to see that the old ways aren't working. But there's also an, a, a discussion going on about harm reduction being co-opted and um, some organizations using the language, but not really putting it into practice. So um, yeah. that's not, yeah. Um, I think it's good that people are starting to embrace it, but we have to be careful about how, who and how it's embraced. Thank you all. I see a question from Dominique about statewide bills and policies. What should we be looking out for in terms of statewide bills or policies that we should be, that support harm reduction models? Sure, yeah, I mentioned SB 57 uh, as one. Um, that's uh, a big one, but it's not gonna be moving forward until next year. There is also a bill, I'm spacing on the number right now, I apologize, that uh, is uh, kind of protecting syringe service programs uh, around the state that have been challenged on kind of some uh, local CEQA grounds. Um, and this one's looking good right now. Uh, I apologize, I don't have the, the number, but we can include this in follow-up. Uh, that's a big one too, to really protect um, uh, the harm reduction providers that we've got statewide and also ensure that we're able to establish further ones. Um, every year there's a coalition called, and the Epidemics Coalition, uh, that really focuses on ending um, uh, uh, the epidemics of HIV, AIDS, STDs, 
overdose and um, they've got annual budget requests to really support these initiatives across the board. Um, these, they're a phenomenal group of uh, providers informed by clinicians uh, and uh, uh, service providers of all kinds statewide, very carefully crafted budget requests and, and those do quite a bit of good to uh, forward those uh, movements uh, statewide. Um, and also the California Syringe Exchange Programs or KSEP, they uh, partner within the epidemics and they push for more funding for syringe service programs to ensure that uh, there is no shortage of resources. Uh, yes, I believe someone mentioned in the chat, uh, uh, Bill 1344, that was the one that I was thinking of. Um, yeah, there, there's quite a few, uh, but at SB 57 is the one particularly next year um, that uh, would be really great if folks could get behind. Thank you all so, so much. I'd love uh, now for, because we're not in person, if you're comfortable, please unmute yourself and give our panelists, Wes, John, and Dell a huge round of applause. Freeze, freeze. Thank you all so much. Keep yourselves unmuted. I do want to give a special shout out to one of our guests, Elizabeth Anderson, who let us know that Elizabeth is running one a one woman harm reduction service out of the trunk of her car in the Bible Belt South. Thank you, Elizabeth, for being here and thank you for what you do. So know that several of my colleagues from Glide Harm Reduction, from N Hep C SF. Oh, Dwan says it won't let us unmute. Well, I, I saw a lot of applause. <laughs> Thank you for, for applauding, even if we couldn't hear you applaud. Um, I see colleagues from across San Francisco Harm Reduction. Thank you for being here. Thank you for everybody showing up to engage with harm reduction as justice, harm reduction as practice, harm reduction as spirituality, as philosophy as intervention, as support, as community, as all of the beautiful, wonderful manifestations that it is. I am blessed and, and privileged to be a part of this work with so many incredible people in San Francisco, in the Bay Area and beyond, including our panelists today, including our Center for Social Justice, who so graciously put on this event. Give them a hand even if we can't hear you do that as well. <laughs> Thank you to Eric, Hannah, Miguel. Um, and again, we will be following up with a list of events upcoming in the San Francisco Bay Area. Please be on the lookout too, as Wes mentioned, August is Overdose Awareness Month, August 31st is Overdose Awareness Day. And so if there's events in your community to mourn lives lost, to celebrate lives saved, to celebrate the people in our community, please feel free to, to take a look and participate. And I encourage everyone who is comfortable and ready to dive deep into what you've learned tonight and to have conversations with your community members because harm reduction is, is a community movement and we are, we are with the people and for the people and it takes all of us to get these policy agendas across and it takes all of us ultimately to destigmatize drug use and, and really dismantle some of the harms that have been done in keeping drug use criminalized as it has been for so long. Um, so I'm grateful for all of you for spending your evening with us and for engaging with Glide Harm Reduction, Glide Center for Social Justice, the mayor of, of the Tenderloin, and all of you. Thank you. <laughs>